Thank you, Patty and Suzanne, and thank you, Jessica, for that message. Before we get started with our presentation today, we've got a couple of little housekeeping items I want to go over for you. Number one, if we are recording these sessions. So if for any reason you have difficulty staying on, if your internet burps on you, if you lose us somewhere along the way, don't worry. We're recording all of the sessions and we're going to post those to YouTube and we will send you the links to those later after the sessions are done. Speaking of things that were sent to you, you also received in your email reminder for today, there were three links that were included in there. One was the program for the whole conference. We hope that you take a look at that because it has not only the bios for all of our speakers, but lots of great information in there. We also sent you the handouts from our speakers. So there are great resources that you can click and look at those. They're all in PDF, so they're very easy for you to look at. And then we also put together some great caregiver resources for you. So Age of Central Texas and Area Agency on Aging brought together all of the wonderful resources that we have to send to you. So take a look at all three of those because there's some tremendous information that can help you because that's why we do these conferences. It is for you. That's why for 19 years we've come together to bring you the best information, the best experts that we can find. It's because we want to help you in your journey and remind you that you are never alone in your caregiving journey. We are always here to help you. One final thing is right down here, you have got a chat feature. It looks like one of those bubbles that you see in the comic strips where those people talk. Click on that chat feature and it's going to bring up the chat room over here on the side. That is where you can ask your questions during today's presentation. And we want you to ask your questions because again, this is specifically for you. So at the end of today's session, we're going to answer your questions live. Now, because we do have limited time, we might not get to every single question. However, we are going to answer your questions. If for any reason we can't answer them today live because we run out of time, someone from Age of Central Texas or the Area Agency on Aging is going to get in contact with you personally and we're going to answer your question. So, don't be afraid to ask those questions because again, this is for you. This is why we're doing this. So we want you to be a part of today's presentation. Also in the chat box, we have posted for you in the event that you have any technical difficulties during the presentation today. If something's not working on your side, you can call Michelle Davis over at the Area Agency on Aging. She is going to put you in touch with some of our tech experts. We have got some retirees from the tech field who are standing by this morning in case anybody's having any difficulties and they can help talk you through and figure out what's not working for you. So I think we've planned for everything today and with that I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Martone with the Area Agency on Aging. She's going to be your facilitator for today for the Q&A and she is going to introduce our speakers. Jessica, take it away. Thanks Rob. Hi, I'm Jessica Martone. I'm the Health and Wellness Coordinator at the Area Agency on Aging. I get to introduce to you our first presenters for Striking a Balance 2020. With us today is Faith Unger. She is a Caregiver U Program Director at Age of Central Texas. She's also a former professional educator and volunteer service coordinator. Faith earned her master's degree in education from the University of Houston, go Cougs and has more than 20 years of public school teaching experience, plus several years as an adjunct professor preparing adult students for teacher certification. Faith is a certified master trainer for powerful tools for caregivers and a matter of balance. She is also a master trainer for savvy caregivers. Also joining Faith today is Lori Hill. She's been the Caregiver U Program Associate with Age of Central Texas since 2017. Lori attended Emporia University, majoring in psychology and sociology. For the past several years, she has been an active community volunteer and helped with family caregiving. Lori is a certified instructor with Savvy Caregiver and a Matter of Balance, and is a master trainer for the powerful tools for caregivers. Thank you ladies for joining us today.
and thank you for being here for this first session, Avoiding Caregiver Burnout During COVID-19. Caring for another person is hard work, but it's noble work. And you are to be commended for the work. The work comes with many rewards and much fulfillment, but also stress. That stress is hard on the caregiver and takes away from enjoying life. Thus, we want to help you care for another with less stress. That is our end goal for today. Caregiving is especially stressful in the time of COVID-19. So after addressing the issue in general, we will apply it directly to the out of the ordinary time in which you are currently caregiving. 36% of family caregivers characterize their situation as highly stressful. Among caregivers aged 55 to 75 who are, are caregivers, they see a 23% higher level of stress hormones in these individuals. Stress is real and stress is present. So where do you feel the stress? Is it maybe in your neck? the pit of your stomach, a headache. What do you look like when you're stressed? Like this person on the screen, do you look frazzled and scattered? How do you act when you are stressed? Do you talk faster? Do you not make good decisions? And what causes you to be stressed? For me, it's usually too much to do in too little time. Understanding what your stress feels like and looks like and what causes the stress is good information for you. Knowing this, you can work on relieving the stress and can understand that perhaps when you're really stressed, this isn't the best time to make a decision. I was a caregiver for a long time, and for many years, I cared for my husband in our home, and his bath time signaled to me it was the end of my caregiver workday. He could still bathe himself, so while he was in the shower, I had a bit of wine, I watched a little TV, I smiled remembering the day. He came out of the shower dressed in his pajamas, and we then did our nightly tuck in the bed routine. I felt like I still had something to give him at that time of the day. Oh, it was a happy time. Next slide. Then came the day when he could no longer bathe himself and putting on his pajamas was challenging. I lost my happy time and added new tasks. I also lost some patience. I think back to that time because hindsight is 2020 vision and I ask myself, what could I have changed so that I wouldn't have been so stressed out at that time. And I thought back to the fact that during that time, just before his shower, he enjoyed watching Wheel of Fortune. I used that time to clean up the kitchen and do chores. But you know, I would have been a less stressed caregiver if I sat down on the couch with him and did a little de-stressing before bath time. Caregivers are real people and they have limits. To make caregiving more reasonable, 
one needs to identify what is reasonable, set that as a boundary, and then access resources to meet the needs beyond the line of what is reasonable. And some of the resources you access may not be caregiving resources. For me, I got help with the lawn care. I hired a lawnmower and called my son to help out with the rest of the lawn chores. I hired a monthly cleaning service. Not having to worry about those things relieved my stress so I could focus a little more on caregiving. Sometimes the amount that is reasonable can actually be increased if one cares well for self. Fill the well and it will have more capacity. The stress of getting him dressed, fed, medicined, and on the bus to the adult daycare, plus the stress of working all day, plus the stress of commuting, plus the stress of greeting him at the door, plus the stress of, well, you get it. It all adds up. When one takes a break, though, the sum is erased or greatly diminished. And the work begins anew with much less accumulation. It is the accumulative total that causes burnout. Burnout is caused by too much long-term stress. It involves a feeling of being overwhelmed, feeling that one can't meet the constant demand. Over time, the interest or the motivation leaves. That is usually when a caregiver actually stops caring. You can become healthier and happier. Your smile and can-do attitude can return. Lori will now give you some information to help you transition from burnout to health and wellness. So what if you are all burned out? What can you do first to begin to move from burnout back to health? Next slide, please. You can start by taking baby steps. Each day, make it a priority to do one small thing from each of these. Physical health, social connections, time for yourself. Think about yourself and your situation. What is one small step that you can take towards improving your physical health? Could you say, today, I'm going to go to bed 30 minutes earlier, or drink more water, or do some exercise? I know that seniorplanet.org offers a free stretching class over Zoom every morning. You may or may not be able to attend the entire class, but it's definitely a good start. Social connections. Could you say, today, I'm going to call a friend, have a backyard visit with a neighbor, text someone I've been meaning to catch up with, or do FaceTime with a friend. Even connecting for a few minutes each day is very important. Time for yourself. Could you say today, I'm going to read a magazine for 10 minutes and relax. I'm going to sit outside and get some fresh air. I'm going to work on that jigsaw puzzle that I enjoy. Think of something that is just for you and that you can use to recharge your battery. It can be something very small, but even small things can make a difference. Now you may need to write these things down each day on a post-it note or a calendar or on your to-do list, but please make it a priority to take small steps each day to make yourself to begin to feel a little bit better. Now let's talk about some ways 
to bring down your stress and to avoid caregiver burnout. First of all, get organized. Being organized is a stress reducer in itself. Think about how much less stress you feel when you know where things are, when you have a plan, and when you know where to get information and to get help. Next slide, please. I always recommend to caregivers to create a binder. Have information about your care receiver all in one place. Think about documents and information that are important for you to keep track of and that you need to get access to most often. So for example, um, insurance information, a list of your care receivers, doctors with their phone numbers and their specialty. Are you the powerful uh, medical power of attorney? If so, then you would need to have that legal form handy in your binder. So your binder will most likely grow as you think of different things that you will need to include in it. But being organized will save you time and it's going to bring down your stress level. Um, begin to build a network of resources. Have a list of people and organizations that you can go to for help and information. Now we have provided you a list of phone numbers and websites for community and national organizations that may be helpful to you. So hopefully that will give you a good start on building your network of resources if you haven't already begun to do so. Also make sure that you're including service providers who you've used in the past. This way you aren't on the hunt to find names and numbers of companies that have done good work for you. And be sure to build a solid medical team. Trying to assemble a care team during a crisis is extremely stressful. It's important to have a medical team, including your specialists, in place as soon as possible. Get necessary documents, such as HIPAA forms, signed with each of the offices. Make sure that you're keeping your regular checkup appointments so that all of the doctors are up to speed with your person's health and with their progress. Having a good medical team in place will really benefit you and your care receiver should an unexpected issue or illness occur. And have a backup or a, create a backup plan. Uh, I have a friend whose neighbor fell down the stairs and ended up in the ICU. That neighbor was a caregiver for her husband who has dementia. There was no backup plan in place, but thankfully the neighbors were able to pitch in for a while. Um, if there had been a backup plan in place, that would have been a different situation. It would have been much less stressful and chaotic. No one expects to have an accident or an unexpected illness, but sometimes that happens. So make a plan for who will care for your person if you are unable to do so. Think about your options. Do you have a family member who you would feel comfortable with to step in? If not, could you hire in-home care? Or would you need a long-term care community? If you do decide to use some kind of paid care, go through the intake process early on so that in case of emergency, your care receiver is already in their system. For paid care, you may want to consider choosing two options and going through the intake process for both of them so that you have a backup. Please make sure that you ask about their protocol for COVID-19 so that you are aware of that also. Create a routine. Now by routine, I simply mean doing the same activities around the same time each day. Having a routine is good for both you and your care receiver, and routines are especially important during the time of COVID-19. It provides a little bit of normalcy for you. Routines create a sense of consistency and what comes next. This will help you to stay organized and get through your day with less stress. 
Now, most people, including care receivers, don't really like surprises. So once the routine becomes a natural part of the day, your care receiver will also be able to be mentally prepared for the next activity and will be more likely to go with the flow. A whiteboard can really come in handy when learning a new schedule, especially for someone with dementia, as it serves for a reminder of what comes next throughout the day, and it can cut down on some of those repeated questions. Routines reduce decision-making. Having to make even minor decisions all day long can be really draining. So sticking to a routine enables you to cut down on the number of decisions that you have to make so that you can spend your mental energy on more important things. Routines also improve sleep. Sleep is important for good health and for overall well-being. Many experts recommend that you go to sleep and you wake up at the same time each day. So it's recommended. Build that sleep schedule until, into your routine to enable you to get some better sleep. And don't forget to build in time for enjoyment. Um, it's common to go through your day and just forget to take time to recharge your battery. So build in micro breaks throughout the day, even if it's only for five or 10 minutes, to do something relaxing and something that you enjoy. I mentioned this a few minutes ago when we were talking about doing at least one small thing for yourself each day. This is a very important part of self-care, which all caregivers need as a way to avoid burnout. Ask for help. Nobody can do everything and it's not good for you to try. So please ask for assistance from others if you need it and give yourself permission to accept help when offered. Give others the gift of being able to help you out. Right now, it may be difficult to get caregiving assistance because of social distancing. Some caregivers do have someone who can help out with caregiving during this time and others don't. Even if you aren't able to get direct caregiving help right now, you still may be able to get help with other tasks and get some of those things off of your very full plate. It's good to make a wish list of things that would be nice to have help with. That way, if someone asks you if they can do something for you, you'll have some options ready. Think about um, what are a couple of things that you would like to have on your wish list. Maybe having someone drop off a meal for you every now and then, or someone to mow your lawn once a month, or getting a package to the post office or some other errand that you've really been wanting to do but you just haven't been able to get it done. Give it some thought and consider your options. Take care of yourself. First, make sure you're eating a healthy diet. What you put in your body really does impact your overall health and how you feel. It's also best to sit down and enjoy your meal. It may be hard to force yourself to do so, but try to get into the habit of not eating on the run. And exercise is a stress reliever and your body needs it for overall health. Sometimes it's hard to work exercise into your schedule, but do try. Walking is always good, and there are options for either joining a live exercise class online. I mentioned earlier that seniorplanet.org offers free classes every day. You could also consider doing a 10-minute exercise video on YouTube. Do whatever works for you, but make sure you're doing something. Sleep is also very important and it needs to be a priority. Without good sleep, it's hard to focus, make decisions, and it's definitely difficult to be patient. Getting less than seven hours of sleep on a regular basis can also have some physical consequences, such as high blood pressure, 
heart problems, and obesity. And if the person that you're caring for is having sleep issues that are affecting your sleep, it's time to address this with their doctor. Make sure also that you're getting regular vaccines and checkups. Address any medical concerns that you're having for yourself. Just as you place high importance on making sure your care receiver gets medical care, make sure that you are also doing the same for yourself. When medical issues are ignored, they definitely have a way of getting worse and they can become more costly in the end as well. So if you are unable to leave your house right now, consider making a telehealth appointment with your doctor. But however you do it, make sure you're getting your needs met. And never ignore mental health. Poor mental health definitely contributes to burnout. Caregiving on its own is stressful, and now we add in the stress of dealing with COVID-19. Stress during an infectious disease outbreak can sometimes cause the following. Fear and worry about your own health and the health of your loved ones, your financial situation, your job, a loss of the support services that you once relied on, changes in sleep or eating patterns, difficulty sleeping or concentrating, worsening of already existing chronic health problems or possibly new ones that have popped up, worsening of mental health conditions, and an increased use of tobacco, alcohol, or other substances. So please call your healthcare provider if you find that stress or mental health issues such as depression are interfering with your daily activities for several days in a row. Definitely get some help with that. And talk about it. Having someone to talk to about your caregiving situation during this difficult time is vital. Hopefully, you have a trusted family member or friend to talk to, a venting buddy, if you will, who's always there to listen. But not everyone has a person like this in their life. If not, seek support elsewhere. Contacting a professional, such as a counselor, can be very helpful. Many counselors are using video platforms to meet with clients from the safety of their own homes. There are also organizations that offer hotlines with volunteers who are available. So in the resources that we've given you, there are some phone numbers for some of these organizations that offer hotlines. Um, support groups are another great way to get an opportunity to talk and gain support and ideas from other caregivers. They're not one size fits all, so you may need to try different support groups until you find one that fits your needs and feels right. Now, right now, many support groups are offering online meetings. Um, we've provided you a list of caregiver support groups that are currently meeting via video platform, and some of them are also meeting by phone. Lastly, make sure that you're using positive self-talk. I'm talking about the endless stream of thoughts that run through your head. Our brain really does listen to what we say to ourselves. Negative and critical self-talk is damaging. It can prevent you from seeking solutions to problems, and it definitely sets the stage for depression. Talk to yourself the way you would talk to a much loved family member or friend. Give yourself grace right now because you're doing the very best you can in a difficult situation. Now, if you're someone who tends to talk to themselves in a negative way, begin to take steps to reverse that. For example, if you catch yourself using statements like, I'm not good enough, or all I can do is deal with problems all the time, and I'm so tired of that. Try to combat those with positive statements, such as, I'm doing the very best I can in this difficult situation, or 
I've solved other problems. I will figure out a way to solve this one too. It's a good idea to also start your day with positive affirmations about yourself and continue those affirmations throughout the day. Again, positive self-talk can be learned and it's also a very powerful stress reducer. And have realistic expectations. Control what you can. As you know, right now we don't have a lot of control, but it's important to focus on things that you do have some control over and let the rest go. You can control some things in your environment and you can control how you react to different situations. You cannot control other people and how they choose to react to various situations. Trying to do so is only going to result in frustration. Set realistic goals. Break large tasks into smaller steps that you can do one at a time. Breaking down a large goal or task into smaller steps can make it seem more manageable and less overwhelming. Setting goals and seeking solutions to problems is important. Even making a small change can make a big impact. So do try to seek some solutions. Lastly, be accepting of what is. Sometimes, no matter how hard we try to solve a problem or change a situation, we're unable to do so. If you do find yourself in that situation where you're unable to solve a problem, take some time and really think about it. Decide whether or not you've done all that you can do. Also consider, reach out to other people for help or suggestions. But if you decide that the problem right now is not solvable, try to be accepting of that and move on. Remember, that change is inevitable and nothing stays the same. So you may find that you are able to solve the problem or situation in the future or down the road. All of the ideas presented for being a healthy caregiver are important, whether during COVID or during ordinary times. But it is the obstacles that, to doing them that really grows during the time of COVID. Perhaps during ordinary times, your care receiver attends daycare or respite care or has a regular caregiver in the home. Perhaps during ordinary times, you as the caregiver work outside the home or have regular activities which you attend or have friends who visit and help. When you have neither of those two situations, then what you have is a caregiver caring for someone 24 seven all alone. Caregiving 24 seven will set you up for becoming stressed and may lead to burnout. But we have some ideas to help you. Not all of those ideas will work for you, but our hope is that maybe you'll find just a few gems that will work for you, or that hearing those gems, you'll brainstorm and think of some ideas that could help. Ponder for a moment. And list for yourself 
what your person is capable of doing with only casual supervision. Is there possibly a room you can convert into a safe room for your person so that constant supervision is not needed and the space is appealing? Are there activities that you could put in there that the person could do alone, if only for a short bit of time? Color sheets, puzzles, word finds, crafts. Early in my caregiving, my adult children created a safe room for their father. He loved it. It was his space, and he made it his own with pictures and a bulletin board a table for him to sit at in the front of the window to do his activities and to watch the squirrels running around. The kids found an old boom box and some Willie Nelson and Elvis Presley CDs. Everything in there was safe and doable. And he felt that he owned the room. This was his true man cave. Building a routine can be helpful for both you and the care receiver. The care receiver will like the consistency in the day, especially if it's written on a whiteboard that he or she can see. My husband would frequently consult the board to make sure that we were doing our routine. For the caregiver, Making a routine can allow one to include times of less intense caregiving. Let me start by giving you a few ideas. Exercise is important for both of you, the caregiver and the care receiver. So, are there a few simple exercises that the two of you could do together? Are there household chores that the person could do with you? and receive the satisfaction of being productive. Folding clothes, scrubbing something, unloading the dishwasher, for example. Is a short walk possible? Both of you could benefit from getting outside for a little bit. Will computer activities work? If not, how about watching an old show like Andy Griffiths or Gunsmoke? I found that the Tubi network runs old shows all day long. Is there someone that can talk with your person for a while on the phone? Would your person benefit from a short rest after lunch? Make the schedule work for both of you. For example, 7 o'clock, breakfast. 7.30, exercise. Eight o'clock chores. Eight thirty phone call from Tom, and you know what that gives you as the caregiver. Nine o'clock outside walk. Nine thirty snack time. It also means that there's a definite bedtime, so that there is an end to your day. And. A few other suggestions for you, the caregiver. Schedule regular phone calls or FaceTime. Use video platforms to virtually meet with others. Join a neighborhood group. Attend free online activities. Call those caregiver hotlines. And for both of you, Explore the AGE website. There are so many resources and ideas available there. The next two slides show the references that we used in today's presentation. We would like to thank you for choosing to attend our presentation today. Please feel free to reach out to Age of Central Texas and the Area Agency on Aging for caregiving resources in the future. We definitely are here for you to serve and support you in your caregiving.
Thank you so much, Faith. Thank you so much, Laurie, for sharing all of that great information. For all of those that are participating, the references that uh, Faith and Laurie talked about, we're going to send those to you once again to make sure that you have those. We're also going to send you a PDF of their PowerPoint deck. So those references that were at the end of it, you don't have to worry about, I didn't get them all written down, we're gonna email it to you, so not a problem there. Before we go to our uh, Q&A, we've got one more quick video we wanna share you, show you. This is from our partners over at Amerigroup, who are one of our sponsors of today's presentation. First day home, there were many things that happened, but I'll tell you this one. I went in and out of this door four times just because I could. Carol has more motivation some days than I have ever thought of having. She sets a goal for herself and she's able to accomplish that. She's resilient. I got wonderful experiences in my life. I found my passport. You did. You're going to love the picture. Oh, well. <laughs> But I was not right in my heart with myself. I have spent all of my life searching for ways to deal with life. Why do I need food so much to feel okay about life? When we met her, she was in a nursing facility. I was very big. Carol had significant health issues, kidney failure, depression. She was bed bound, she was incontinent, she had heart failure. I had two syringes filled with insulin. I had two medicine cups filled with pills. I was 547 pounds. There were days when I would go in there and I didn't know if uh, that was the last time I would see you. Before I got the help that I needed, I had just decided to give up on life. I was just going to die. Some would look at her in a nursing facility and not develop the plans that we did with her and not think that she could be where she's at today. To make it work, we have to understand what support they have and need. And it starts with listening first. I was so long not heard. We use our person-centered approach to identify their goals, their desires, and then help put the services and supports in place that will help them achieve that. She was struggling to find her voice, and person-centered is all about that person's voice. Here's somebody that comes into my world listening to me, talking to me about possibilities, just truly caring, and gave me a sense of personhood, a human being, not a case. She had to have her own motivation. Things like losing weight takes a lot of individual tenacity, but not something somebody can do for you. So we did it with her, but, but she had to be in the driver's seat. So when we first talked with Carol, we didn't start a lot of plans for her to transition out of the nursing facility because she wasn't ready. So it first started with us talking to her and, and her mentally preparing. The first time that I mentioned going home to her, a light came on, but she had a lot of questions. My first reaction was, me go home? No, I don't think so. But then all night long, I thought about it. And then one day I said, I'm ready to make changes in my food. We need to meet people where they are. And so your goals have to be set where they're realistic and things that, that you can physically do at that time. We went from bed bound to jerry chair, from a jerry chair to a wheelchair, until eventually she met me at the front door sometimes. Every individual that we can support who then no longer needs our help but can help others, it's why we do what we do. Isn't that love? I mean, that's love when you get someone to the point where you no longer need them anymore. I know it was your job but you bring yourself to your job and your heart to your job. And so for me, I'll just always want to. We coordinate with the nursing facilities, we coordinate personal care in the home, whatever it is that will help that individual live independently and successfully. I was given a certain number of hours a week for home health aids. It helped me to feel like I was contributing to my family, which at that time I couldn't have done by myself. And that is nothing but confidence building. She progressed enough 
that, um, as she says, she graduated from the program. One of our largest goals in providing long-term services and supports is to bring somebody into the community. So it's the meaningful life that we want to help people achieve. The amount that she's paying forward right now is incredible. Hi, my name is Carol, and I'm calling to see how much staff is doing today. It just has opened my eyes to of our interdependent as a, as a humanity. I love to smile at people and connect with them. We really, truly are all each other has. Everything is sweeter, is sweeter in my life. You know, I was watching that video and it made me think that uh, for those of you who have been to our caregiver conferences in the past, we talk a lot about how caregivers should not try to take on everything all at once. Uh, we always suggest that you make your list of everything and you go from one to two, then two to three, then three to four. And that really was brought home in this great video about Carol. So right now we are going to do our Q&A. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica. We're also going to bring in Melissa Crawford from the Area Agency on Aging, who's going to help out with information along with Lori and Faith. And we are going to answer your questions. So ladies, take it away. All right, well, Lori and Faith, y'all did a fabulous job. Um, we only really have one question left in the chat box. So I'm going to just remind our participants out there, now's the time, if you've got a question, um, put it in that chat box, um, type as fast as you can, and we're going to get to it before we end here. Um, Lori, I think this question is for you. Um, we have a question from Melody, and she is asking, how important is it to carry the legal documents with you when taking your loved one to a medical appointment? Should you always take your binder with you? There's just so much paperwork that accumulates with caregiving. There is a lot of paperwork. Um, so not necessarily important to take your whole binder. Um, you can have a separate medical folder and only have in that what, what you would need at medical appointments. So if you are the medical power of attorney, yes, that might be good to have that. HIPAA documents might be good because you wanna make sure that, that the doctor has, um, can communicate with you and it's all legal. Um, Prescript a, a list of the prescriptions and doses, those kinds of things are always helpful to have at medical appointments. And it's good to ask for that printout at the end of the appointment that'll give you kind of notes. Um, sometimes they'll tell you to go to the portal and print them out yourself. But if you are not able to do that, or if you simply don't feel like you have time to do that, you know, just use your polite assertiveness and say, would you please have those notes printed out for me. Those are good to have because then when you go to an, a different appointment with a different doctor who's wanting to know, okay, what's been going on, you can simply give those notes to that new doctor and he or she can review that very quickly and it's just a lot more, um, more efficient. Faith, am I leaving anything out about what would be helpful to take to a, a medical appointment? Well, thank you for asking. One of the things I thought of as you were talking is it's important to also carry, a, carry with to each appointment your list of doctors and their contact information. And with each doctor visit, I would ask that documents be shared and I would sign any forms I needed to sign so that all the different doctors could be communicating with each other. Yeah, absolutely. All right, y'all did a great job and we're not getting any more questions in the chat box. So um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, and thank y'all for joining us. We really appreciate you uh, jumping in there and doing this online virtual presentation of Striking Balance for the first time. Rob, are you gonna lead us out for today? I am, but it looks like we got one more quick question asking uh, how, part, how important is it to have a list of the medication and doses with, for your loved one with you? Um, the, obviously, we always talk about it's not uh, if you're going to have an emergency, it's when you're going to have that emergency. And so 
Uh, I would think that it would be important that you have that with you at all times. Uh, Lori, what's your take on that? Um, yes, a list of the medications and doses, um, definitely um, on the refrigerator in case for some reason EMS needs to be called, they're gonna go and, and see what, what, what the person is taking. And in a situation like that, you're so stressed out and nervous that you might not remember oh, he's taking this and it's at this dose. So have that updated list and make sure you write the date. This is when it was last updated so that the person looking at it, the medical professional or EMT, so that they know when it was last updated. That's really important. I would add to um, a tip given to me by another caregiver, all because in an emergency, one does get rattled. Mm -hmm. The tip was to keep one copy in the glove compartment of the car so that you're, if you're running to ER, it's, it's with you, no matter what else you might forget. That's a I'll just add an additional tip. Um, one of the classes that we teach, of course, chronic disease self-management at the Area Agency on Aging, and I learned from my participants, you've got free apps on your phone. Mm -hmm. that will let you put your medication um, list for yourself, for your loved one. You're not going anywhere without your phone in these days, right? So even in an emergency, you're not going to forget the phone. So use those free apps. There's ones you can pay for too, but go for the free ones first always. And just That's to not be left out, I would also like to add one thing, and that is working with caregivers all the time. Um, it can happen that the caregiver and the care receiver end up in an accident together. Um, and so it's really important if there is another very close per person nearby, the f another family member, the emergency contact person, that they also are aware of these medications. They may never have to use it, but, but if the caregiver's out, they're away, they were part of an ac the accident, um, they still need this information. And that, that first responder that's neighbor, friend, or family, if they have access to that, they can show that right away. I know we've had to do that in different situations where we may not have been the direct family, but we were there on site. And like you said, the caregiver is rattled. They, they can't, they don't know if it's in the glove box, if it's in the freezer, if it's in their purse. Um, they're, they're trying to um, digest what's taking place right now. So um, that would be the only other thing I would add. The and other I'll question that just popped up from Karen is what are the free apps for that medication list? Um, I have an iPhone, so I'm, I, I have my limited um, scope there, um, but my health app in my, on my iPhone has that um, ability in there. So, um, you know, check with, with what's available in your app store um, and, and check that out. And I think you could also probably just Google for free app for medication list and you'll probably get a good, whole list of uh, opportunities there. Also, talking about uh, your medication list, all of us who are caregiving, our loved ones have two or three doctors, and they often don't talk to each other. And so I think it's also a good idea. I have found with my parents to have that medication list with you, because that way the doctor over here, who doesn't know what the doctor over here prescribed, you can show what the person's already taking. Uh, you want to avoid those side effects from uh, cross-contamination of medications, all that great stuff. So um, probably not a bad idea to keep it with you at least two different places so you know where it is. And Lori, great idea on that binder because, you know, when you're searching for something and can never find it, if you've got everything in a binder, you know that's your go-to place where you've got everything. And in case of an emergency, you can just grab that binder and mm -hmm. go, and everything is right there. Especially uh, important things like your power of attorney. You may not think to take that with you when the ambulance comes to the house and you're running out the door and you get to the hospital and you need to have that so that they can tell you what's going on. So if it's all in the binder, you're ready to go. Thank you so much, Lori Faith. 
We appreciate that. Jessica, Melissa, thank you so much for helping us out today. And especially to you, our caregivers who are watching us today, thank you so much for spending the time with us. We hope that we shared some information that'll help you out. Reminder that we are going to send you a little bit later on the link to the entire presentation that was recorded so that you can watch that at your leisure again. We'll send you also the links for the resources, the handout, the program, and all of that great information. Plus, we're going to send you a PDF of all of the PowerPoints from today. And so we're going to make sure that you're taken care of. If you're joining us again this afternoon for our Caregiving 101 presentation, we will see you at one o'clock. Or if you're joining us later in the week for our other presentations, we'll see you later in the week. Thank you so much. Hope you have a wonderful lunch and we will see you very soon.